USCHO.com. This is the USCHO Spotlight, a weekly podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online at USCHO.com, featuring conversations with college hockey coaches and players and journalists who cover the sport. Welcome to USCHO Spotlight for Tuesday, December 17th, 2019. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly. This podcast is brought to you by the 2020 NCAA Frozen Four, April 9th and 11th in Detroit, Michigan. For tickets, visit NCAA.com slash Frozen Four. Jim, it's World Juniors time, and the guy who has been the analyst for the broadcast for the last decade is here to talk to us about this year's tournament. We'll continue our look with the U.S. World Junior team now, and we are joined by one of the men who will be calling the game, uh, analyst Dave Starman. He, alongside Stephen Nelson, uh, will have each and every U.S. game for NHL Network uh, here stateside. Uh, Dave, welcome to the show, and uh, here we are again, uh, late December, and we're talking about uh, some international hockey. And it's uh, it's always a good time of year. It's a great tournament. It's exciting. It's got drama. And I think the best part for U.S. viewers, since we started doing this in 2009, and that was the tournament in Ottawa, this thing has just continued to build momentum. And 2009 wasn't a great tournament for the U.S. 2010 obviously was, in my opinion, still the most exciting tournament I've been a part of. And that was the one where we won gold in Saskatoon. And then, you know, moving through, it's had some ups. It's had a couple of down years you know i think there were three straight years where the u.s lost to the russians or at least two of the three years u.s lost to the to the russians on january 2nd it didn't play for a medal and then the last three years it's you know it's been in the medal round a couple of gold medal games and been really exciting and you know the thing for me that's the best part about it is you know a lot of really good college coaches do a great job coaching this team and and seeing so many of the ncaa players that you know we get to watch a lot of uh, play starring roles in this tournament and Troy Terry a couple of years back would be the perfect example. Well, let's get right into that roster, if you don't mind. Uh, a lot of uh, some familiar faces from last year's team. Um, a lot of familiar faces to college fans uh, looking up and down. Give me some of the players that stand out to you and what and things that you like about this year's roster. Uh, let's start in goal. I think the obvious is it's Spencer Knight. That he was there last year. So we got a really good look at what this tournament is all about. And I think that, I mean, the thought is he plays seven games. Maybe somebody else jumps in and takes a game here and there. They're going to have two games that they should win. I always hate to use that term, but they've got two games that they should win. One being against Germany, the other one being against the Czech Republic. But those games could get tricky because they'll play Germany the day after they play Canada to open up. And then they'll play the Czech Republic as their fourth team in five nights the day after they play the Russians. So, they're set up for a couple of traps in there, but I do think that Spencer Knight should be the guy that's pretty stable for him. And you know, when talking with David Lasson, who's handling the goaltenders, and you, know, you talk to Mike Ayers at Boston College, the goalie coach there, it's it's pretty well established that Spencer Knight's the kind of kid that can digest one game, put it behind him, and then play another one the next night. So uh, I think if there's anything that gives the U.S. a great chance at a gold medal, it's certainly going to be the goalie who has been told to me by my colleagues in the scouting community is the best goaltending prospect out of amateur hockey since Carey Price. When you look at the defense core, there's a couple interesting guys here. One being Keandre Miller from the University of Wisconsin, who incredible athlete, great skater, effortless, really good offensive. The question becomes, what role does Keandre play within the text of the World Junior Team? He's, he's certainly a guy that could be a power play guy. He's certainly a guy that became a real good penalty kill guy when he was playing for the National Team Development Program. And five on five, he's like a fourth forward. So I think that Miller, from an offensive standpoint, layering attacks, filling lanes is going to be great for him. And the question will be whether or not that big six foot four frame is in a defensive posture as well, and making sure that he's playing 200 feet. And the other defenseman, Jimmy, that I really like, Spencer Stasty from University of Notre Dame, who. You know, I watched him play a lot last year. I thought to myself, this kid really is the modern defenseman. And it's funny because I was talking to Seth Afford and Nick Four from the under-18 team and was having that same conversation. I mean, he's a guy that defends with his feet. He gaps forward a ton. He's surfing all over the ice. He's great with a stick. He's a former forward converted to a defenseman, skates like the wind, and breaks up a ton of plays. So I think with Miller and Stassi, you got a really couple interesting guys there on the back end. 
When you look at the forward position, obviously college fans will know the name Cole Caulfield from Wisconsin. Uh, a few more uh, names, but it doesn't feel like you get to throw, throw Turcotte in there as well. But it doesn't feel like this is a team that's deep in household names at the forward position. Will they uh, have a sort of a power line as they have in many years of the past? Or is this going to have to be kind of scoring by committee? Well, I think last year took away that, that concept of you need a number one line to go through the tournament. Because if you remember, Ryan Palin started on the wing and then Jack Hughes got hurt. So Palin got moved back to the middle, which I know my former colleagues in Montreal were thrilled with. Because uh, they absolutely wanted to see him down the middle. And he was great during that tournament. So his line was super. And Evan Barrett's line was really good. I know he had Madden on one side, and I, I think he had Tate's on the other. And so you had two lines that really could can be considered your number one line. I think this year you're looking at that same kind of situation. I, I know certain line combinations popped out yesterday when I sat with Coach Sandlin yesterday for a while. You know, we talked about some different line combos that he can go with. But the general consensus was that. This will be more by committee, and because of some of the youth up front in the, you know, kind of the A plus players, uh, they're hoping that they've got enough depth that they can move some guys around the lineup so that as the tournament goes on, they can find different scoring from from different areas. But you know, obviously, Cole Caulfield is going to create some excitement. I think Shane Pinto from the University of North Dakota, he makes this team, and I think he will. I think Shane Pinto is the guy to watch. I mean, he he is dynamic. He's a big boy, with a lot of skill. He's been great as a freshman on a team that has been dominant this year. He can score. He can defend. And on that big rink, I don't think his size is going to go away. I think it's even going to be more of a factor. So, yeah, you're right. There are not a lot of household names, but there's a lot of good ones. And a guy like I think a guy like Pinto could have a really good tournament. We're talking with Dave Starman about the 2020 World Juniors Championship. Let's talk a little bit about Scott Sandlin. Obviously, uh, three national championships in the decade is a pretty good pedigree. And when you talk to other coaches around hockey, they'll tell you what a what a smart, what an intelligent guy Sandlin is. Head coach before in 2005, he's been an assistant. And if you want to remember back to 1984, he was a player. What does Scott Sandlin bring to this as head coach? I think he brings a ton because I think when you look at the three Duluth teams, or the Minnesota Duluth teams that have won this tournament, you can make a case that none of those teams were the best team in the tournament in terms of talent on paper. And that's a credit to the coaching staffs of each of those three teams that won because he basically was like a team that might have been a little underskilled in certain areas and not as deep as the teams that they beat and managed to to win those games. And one of the keys to Scott Sandlin is as the games get tighter, he gets calmer. And I think that has an incredible effect on – on a team, especially a young team. Like keep in mind, a couple of years back when, when UMD won the first of their back to backs, and they basically won it with a freshman defense score. And if there is ever a reason to panic, it would be going to the frozen four with a whole bunch of freshmen on your back end. But those guys are great and a lot of the reasons they were great is because they played without the pressure of a head coach being tense and worrying about who of that defense score shouldn't be on the ice in key situations as opposed to making sure that those guys were playing and everybody was playing their role and so I think with Sandlin, you get a really good tactician, you get a guy who really knows how to handle his bench, and you get a guy who really knows how to utilize his staff. And to me, the number one thing about being a great head coach is being able to utilize your assistants. And the boy, has he got a bevy of them, starting with Brett Larson, who you won a title with at UMD a couple of years back, now the head coach at St. Cloud State. You got Jerry Keefe at Northeastern, who, who I think is a brilliant offensive mind. He'll handle the power play and a lot of the offensive schematics. You, you got Steve Biller, who's Ohio State right now, who's going to handle the penalty kill, a lot of the defensive type stuff. And, you know, anywhere the killer's gone, and teams have won, whether it be back to back national titles at Denver, a championship at Providence, and the medals that he has won over the last three years with Team USA. And, you know, then you get David Lassonde, who's terrific with the goaltender. So I, I think, understandable, and you got a guy who knows how to delegate, you got a guy who knows how to take the pulse of his team, you got a guy who knows how to construct a lineup, and you got a guy who, because he's won, is not going to panic if he's facing a one-goal lead late in a, an important game as opposed to some guys who might overreact and just play their best six players ad nauseum until they run out of gas. It's a pretty compressed schedule. They have a couple of days of practices. Uh, they make cuts. They head to Europe, a couple of preliminaries. And they've got to con- congeal a team here. Even though some of these guys have played together before, they're still putting together pieces from all over the place. So what are the challenges that... Uh, Scott Sandlin and his staff have, and how do they approach 
putting together a team this quickly for such a big stage? You know, the late E.G. McGuire once gave me a great, great lesson in short-term tournament preparation. And one of the things that he always preached was you got to be able to catch lightning in a bottle. And a lot of it has to do with chemistry first. And, you know, this is the kind of tournament where we talked about the 19-year-old tournament. And the question will be whether or not, you know, they've got enough 19-year-olds to, to ride it. But the other part of it is, as long as you've got goaltending and a power play, things can come together quickly. And I think that's, you know, that would obviously be one of their challenges. But on the chemistry side, you know, in talking with Sandy yesterday, in talking with Brett Larson, in talking with Steve Miller, the one thing that they have discussed is they've got a lot of low-maintenance players in their dressing room. And low-maintenance guys tend to come together a lot quicker. And, you know, yes, you've got a couple of big names in there. you got a kid like Caulfield in there who, you know, everybody's raving about and, and everybody gave the Hobie to, you know, 10 minutes into the season. You know, but he's a guy who everybody has said is when he's in your dressing room, he's a great guy to have in your room. So you know, the one thing I think that he's got going for him is, A, they get out of North America and they'll get some time on a plane and they'll get some time away where there's not a whole lot of distractions pulling them into different directions. And and that, to me, is going to be, I think, a huge thing. But I think with Sandlin and a short-term prep, he's not going to complicate things. And to me, that, I think, is really the key for Team USA's success. He's not a guy that overthinks it. He takes a look at what he has, he makes his decisions, and then off they go. More with Dave Starman in a moment after this word from the 2020 NCAA Frozen Four, April 9th and 11th in Detroit, Michigan. For tickets, visit NCAA.com slash Frozen Four. This is the USCHO Spotlight, a weekly podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online. Every time you show up, every time you make your presence heard, whether you clap your hands or stomp your feet, lead the chant or join the chorus, however you choose to be a fan, you make the game. The NCAA Frozen Four, April 9th and 11th at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit. Visit NCAA.com slash Frozen Four to get your tickets today. We're talking with analyst Dave Starman. He will be the analyst on the broadcast on NHL Network for the U.S. team in the World Juniors Championship coming up in just a week or so. Uh, you're talking about uh, Sandlin staying calm under pressure. And I think back a couple of years ago uh, when Bob Motzko was coaching the team and he told the players to have fun and enjoy the moment. And, and I'm sure that plays into it. But what is the week like for the players? And, and then maybe after that, what's it like for the coaches? I'm sure the coaches have less time for fun than the players. I'll tell you what. The, Bob Motzko said it to me. Don Lucia has said it to me. A couple other guys have coached. Keith Elaine has said it to me. They said these three weeks are the beauty of these three weeks as a coach is it's a three week think tank with nothing but hockey on your brain, and which makes me so jealous. And you know, I think that for the coaching staff, it's a it's a matter of personal management. It's a matter of pacing themselves. It's a matter of not going over film ad nauseum and trying to reinvent the wheel in practice. It's a matter of finding your strength, <clears throat> excuse me, and utilizing it to the best of your ability. And that means, you know, whether it's line combinations or D's or power play stuff, it's taking your assets and utilizing them in, in the proper way. Game management, to me, in the World Junior Tournament has been the number one thing. And I think, you know, one guy that did a great job with game management was back in 2010 was Dean Blaze. It just, the way he and Marco Siki and Tom Ward ran that bench, it was, it was an amazing thing to watch. And from a team management perspective, it was really unique to watch. They put a ton of importance on their leadership group, which was guys like Derek Stepan and Chris Kreider and Jerry DeVigo. And they let that leadership group really run the team. And I think for Sandy and for the players, it's a matter of the coaches setting somewhat of the agenda and then the leadership group of the team making sure that everybody stays dialed in and on board. And I mean, it sounds simple, but it's almost that simple in terms of being able to pace yourself through seven games and 12 nights during the tournament and a couple of exhibition games before that. Dave, let's just look at a little bit at the bracket and uh, the four teams that uh, the U S have in their pool, Canada, Germany, Russia, and the Czech Republic. It looks kind of like a murderer's row to me. I think it's a, you know, a pretty difficult draw. 
Uh, they, they start out, though, with Canada, uh, the traditional rival uh, in this tournament, in any international tournament. It used to be that they always seemed to fix it so that these teams could play on New Year's Eve. Uh, the U.S. won't even play a New Year's Eve game this this time. They'll play back-to-backs, 26 and 27 in December, get the 28th off, then back-to-back again, 29-30, then a couple of more days off for a quarterfinal round. Do you like the way that this schedule sets up for them? Uh, I'm going to give you two answers to that. Here's why I do. I like getting Canada out of the way early so you're not sitting there obsessed about, obsessing about it and thinking about it. Get it out of the way, play the game, and then move on. So that's number one. But here's the thing. They play Canada, then they play Germany. So like we talked about a little bit of the trap game. But they get the big game out of the way early, and they did that a few years ago. I think it was in Sweden. It might have been the Malmo tournament where they played Canada first, and it was a pretty good game, and then they lost to the Swedes right after that. But, but they kind of gained some steam moving past that. And then they get the Russians in game three. Uh, that's certainly no easy bargain. And the Russians have played the U.S. really tough over the last couple of tournaments. So, I mean, you're looking at a situation where I like the fact that they're going to go into game four battle-tested and they're going to go into the middle round very battle-tested with two really hard games right off the kicker. The only problem is, is realistically, you could be two and two going into the middle round. And if you're two and two on January 2nd, that means you're playing the second-place team on the other side, the second place team is going to be the Finns or the Swedes, and it gets a little tricky when you when you get into that dynamic that early on in the medal round, uh, especially the January second game. So, do I like it? I do because it's going to bring out the best of their competitive nature. Does it worry me a little bit? It does because, like I said, the last thing you want to do is go in two and two and have to play the Finns or the Swedes as your first game of the medal round. And don't you think for one second when, when, uh, when it all comes to down say about to it, things, the we'll ask this and let, let you go, Dave. Night, but on uh, December 30th. Usually you think crowd. of the so, U.S. I mean, as one of the favorites right for this tournament. Are they an underdog more than they typically are this year? And if so, is that the role that they need to embrace? If this tournament's in North America, they're a favorite. Being at this tournament is overseas with the fatigue factor potential, a little bit of the jet lag early on. Uh, I'm not, They're not an underdog, but I, I would say that them and – them in Canada are in a little bit of a tougher spot than than normal. Though Canada tends to do pretty well when when they get off the home soil a little bit because I think the pressure for them is a little less too. But I, I just think with this team, I just think that the youth of this team is going to have a little bit of a challenge in front of it. They've been through this format before, but they haven't been through it at the under twenty level where guys are a little bit bigger and stronger and 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 can can be a little bit smarter on the ice at times. So to me, the question is: Is the U.S. youth, despite how skilled it is, mature enough to handle the grind of what the World Juniors is on a game-by-game basis to get themselves there. And a lot of these kids that come off the under-18 team, you can make a case that was the best under-18 team we've ever had. The skill level of this team top to bottom may not equal what they are used to playing with at the U18. So I think they're going a little bit of an underdog, but but underdog might be too strong as a pure word. Well, it is the World Junior Championship, the traditional uh, tournament played right after Christmas uh, every single year. And this year it'll be in the Czech Republic. Uh, Steve Nelson and Dave Starman will have the call on NHL Network every single American game. Uh, Dave, rest up that voice uh, to start doing some studying and uh, enjoy the championship. It's always such a fun event. We always love that you bring it to us. I appreciate the good words and uh, we will try to keep you entertained. Thanks, guys. Jim, it's interesting how much more attention is paid to the World Juniors Championship by the U.S. these days than a few years ago. And a big part of it has been the broadcast that Dave Starman has been part of. And I remember 20 some odd years ago riding a team bus on a way to broadcast a game. And all the Canadian players were watching the World Juniors updates and very excited about it. Meanwhile, the U.S. players were almost unaware. Things have certainly changed in the intervening years. Yeah, I actually remember when when uh, Boston and Worcester uh, hosted the championships. Uh, going, this is going back to the mid '90s, and you know a lot of people didn't even care. I mean, the, the attendance wasn't great, and uh, it didn't have the uh, cachet that it has now. And I think the broadcasts have been a really big part of that, and the support of NHL Network for USA Hockey, but also the the talent uh, obviously changes things too. And you know, Dave Starman mentioned that 2010 team that got the gold medal, and I feel like that launched this tournament onto a lot of the radars of, of hockey fans. And uh, it also kind of was right about the same time. I think it was 2009 was the 
first uh, NHL network broadcast uh, that was produced by an American network instead of just taking a Canadian feed. So I, I think the combination success and exposure has brought this to um, the radar of hockey fans. And it's a fantastic tournament to watch. I, I do uh, love when it's in North America because the game times tend to be more uh, – it's easier to watch. You know, you don't have the the late game being a one o'clock start, which will be what it is here. And I mean, you know, the the gold medal game will be played at, at one o'clock on, on a Sunday. Uh, you know, which also happens to be the same time that the NFL will be playing their playoffs. And uh, same thing on for the semifinals. The the day before, you know, one o'clock on a Saturday is is one of your semifinals. And again, that'll be against football playoffs because it's wild card weekend, I believe. So it's just you know, I I, I love it when it's stateside. The uh, IIHF does not. Uh, give a hoot about USA hockey and and protecting anything or the product. They understand that the popularity over in Europe is pretty big as well. So uh, I, I think that, that w- that's what makes this tournament so special. You know, I'd like to talk a little bit about this team and get your take on it. A, a couple of thoughts that Dave Starman had that are interesting. You know, he highlighted Spencer Knight and, and obviously a very good goaltending talent and the other goalies on the roster certainly will be capable as well. But he talked about building a team by committee and not really having anybody stand out. Maybe this makes it the right year for Scott Sandlin, who, as Starman noted, has been able to take what has not necessarily been the best team and have success with them. What are your thoughts on this year's team? Do you kind of line up with Dave on this? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, he didn't want to call them an underdog. I think that they they probably should be trying to relish that role because even within their own uh, bracket the thought that they could finish fourth out of five is possible. You know, you've got Canada and you've got Russia in there, and, and you know, you, you lose those two games, then there's a lot of pressure on that Germany game, which is sandwiched in between. And we've seen Germany, you know, not give teams fits, but they've been competitive, more competitive in recent years. And then the last game against the Czech Republic, the host team, no matter what, they're going to be fired up to play the Americans uh, on December 30th. So if you end up you know, losing three of those four games and barely get out of your your bracket, uh, get out of your pool into the uh, the bracket play. And you're now the four seed, and you're playing the number one seed. Maybe there's room for upsets and stuff like that, but it's it can be a tough drive. It just puts a lot of if you lose to Canada on the opening game, it puts a lot of pressure on that German game uh, the next day. Uh, and then even more pressure as you build. If you don't get wins, you've got to start piling up some wins. So a, a win against Canada on the 26th would be a great start for the Americans. And I think if they would have pulled that game out, that's when we have to start taking this team seriously and saying that they maybe aren't that much of an underdog and they have the ability. And for Canada, same thing applies. That U.S. game is important to get started on the right foot. Everything you said about uh, USA would apply to Canada, too. It's true. Uh, you know, I do. I don't know what it is about this tournament that uh, no matter what, the Canadians seem to be able to pull pull a lot of uh, rabbits out of hats when they need them. They've been in a lot of games that you thought that they were going to miss a medal round or, they're, you know, whatever it's going to be. And they have had, they've had their stumbles in the last 10 years. But at the same time, they just I don't know what it is. It's, it's hard to describe. Canada always seems to rise on this stage. They love this big stage. Well, if you missed it last week, we talked to head coach Scott Sandlin on USCHO Spotlight. Find that podcast and all our other podcast episodes at uscho.com slash podcast. This has been brought to you by the 2020 NCAA Frozen Four, April 9th and 11th in Detroit, Michigan. For tickets, visit ncaa.com slash Frozen Four. For Jim Connolly, I'm Ed Trefsker, and we'll catch you next time. This has been the USCHO Spotlight, a production of U.S. College Hockey Online. Visit uscho.com slash podcasts to listen or subscribe. 